it's not as exciting as living in the jungle, but it's, it's fun, so. <laughs> So just a quick note um, about me and where I'm coming up at this from. Um, so I am responsible for leading Wiley's US peer review operations. Uh, I oversee 17 full-time staff. We work on about 150 journals, um, spanning all disciplines, so humanities, social sciences, up through you know oncology and all that fun stuff. Um, and I spend a lot of my day working with editors on making peer review better. Um, so I'm big into user experience, analytics, looking at workflows, how do we use reviewers, how do we use editors. So peer review is kind of undisputably the backbone of academic publishing. Without peer review, you know, how would you know what's good? How would you know what's bad? It's kind of the vanguard of integrity here. Um, but if you read The Scholarly Kitchen, you know, you read Retraction Watch, your own day-to-day -day life, I mean, the question comes up, how do you make peer review better? And I think that that's kind of a broad question, so bear with me as I use a metaphor here. Let's consider this picture as peer review. If you wanted to be cynical, you could make a horror movie reference. I'm not gonna do that. This is simply a picture made up of other pictures. But take 100 journals, line them up, look at them from a mile high. Their peer review process is gonna look something like this. But when you click in deeper, everything looks a little different. Every journal has its own components, every journal has its own quirks, its own personalities. Every journal has a similar process. Things go through editors, they go through reviewers, they go through decision, but how does that all work? So you really have to break it up into its individual components. And lucky for those of us who work in editorial offices, there's challenges everywhere. Just starting right from the submission part of the process, what hoops are we asking authors to jump through? Authors have to worry about organizing their data, writing the paper, getting things together, then they have the disclosures, consent forms, and all that fun scientific stuff. And that's before it even gets to the journal. You know, we ask authors to format things a certain way. It has to be A4 size paper, two inch margins. It has to be Chicago reference style. These are all things that we're asking them to do before it even goes out to review. So one of the questions we have to ask ourselves, is the author our valued partner? Are they making the journal work, or are we treating them like suppliers? You know, assigning, finding reviewers, if you talk to 2,000 editors, 2,000 editors are gonna say this is probably the most difficult part of their process, right? You know, most journals rely on their superstars, the people that say yes, turn things around quickly, um, but how do we, are we over relying on those folks? How do we recognize reviewers? How do we engage early career researchers that aren't necessarily known to us? So there's a lot of challenges there. Transparency. Um, I won't spend too much time on open peer review, but you know, this idea of how much do we open the box for authors? How much should they know what's going on? Should they know who's doing their paper? Should they know how long things take? Should they know if there are delays? These are questions that a lot of journals are struggling with. Um, ethical concerns, I think Chloe just <laughs> nailed pretty much the big ones that we're dealing with, so it's good to see. Um, and then speed versus service to the community. What's the tipping point here? You know, these are as much logistical problems as they are academic. You know. Editors-in-chief, associate editors, they should be focusing on the science. So it comes to those of us who lead the editorial offices to figure out these kind of problems. How do we make them work? So authors is kind of what I wanted to talk about today. Authors are the constant lifeblood of any journal. You could have the best editor in the world, but if they alienate authors, authors don't submit, you either don't have a journal or you have a very sad and tiny one. You know, in a world where new journals pop up by the day, many of them unsavory, many of them will be gone by next year. Authors want to be out there, they want their process to be fast, they want their process to be easy, and they want it to comply with all of their authorship requirements. Those are kind of the three key tenets. You know, it's becoming increasingly difficult to say our impact factor is X, and that's gonna sustain us forever and ever. It's not the case. Like I said, many authors see review as that black box. You know, manuscripts get sent back at the point of submission for seemingly arbitrary reasons. They don't hear from a journal for months and months. And when they do, sometimes it's just, sorry, it's not a fit. No constructive feedback, no nothing. Those authors aren't gonna come back. Every improvement we make to the peer review process should be transparent, should improve author experience. So I'm gonna give you a couple of case studies around that. And just a quick bonus thing. Um, <laughs> this isn't a case study, but it just popped to mind. We work with a journal that uses a lot of heavy mass, a lot of equations. Are folks familiar with LaTeX? Kind of, sort of, okay. Half and half, that's fine. Um, editor didn't trust LaTeX, so always asked authors to submit neither a Word or a PDF file. So now authors have to take that extra step, 
convert their files, make sure it comes across correctly before they even submit to the journal. Well, after years of authors complaining, the editor finally, you know, he capitulated, and he said, we'll take LaTeX files under one caveat. Anybody want to guess what his caveat was? He wanted a word in a PDF file with the LaTeX. So you can do it your way, but you've got to do it my way. Um, that's just, you know, that's kind of mind-boggling. Um, so the first case study I want to talk about, a society-owned journal in the life sciences gets about 800 submissions annually, a good-sized journal for the field. Um, we started working with them in mid-2014, coinciding with the change in editors-in-chief. Um, so, you know, fresh blood everywhere, really good time to get on in these things. The author was really big on author experience, so very much a woman after my own heart. Um, she wanted to make submissions simpler, and she wanted to shorten review times. And her term, not mine, she wanted to cut the fat. So take a really close look at her editorial board, at her associate editors, what she was asking authors to do. Um, and the kind of goal for her was, she set her target time to first decision at 40 days. That wasn't arbitrary. Um, a lot of editors I talked to are very aware of how their own journal is doing, maybe a couple of others, but they don't necessarily know where they fall within the field. So be realistic, talk to your colleagues, talk to publishers, you know, talk to your publisher about how is my journal doing, not just are we improving year on year or are we stagnant? How are we doing in relation to the field? How, you know, are we falling behind the times? So the first thing that we looked at in this journal was author submission. So the journal was stuck in a really old way of thinking. Um, the person who had been running the editorial office before we came in was very lovely and very ready to go in another direction. Um, the journal was sending things back constantly. About 40% of submissions weren't going back because they weren't a fit for the journal or because you know the author had not gotten the proper consent forms. They were going back for things like, you didn't put line numbers in your manuscript. You gave us Chicago style instead of APA. Just crazy things like that. And a lot of authors will do those things and dutifully come back because they trust the journal. A lot of those authors weren't coming back. They were going elsewhere. And that's before the journal's even gotten to review. So these are good scientific papers that are getting published elsewhere because we're stuck thinking about you know, how important a reference is. So what the EIC did um, in conjunction with my team was to simplify everything. Um, the journal was asking for a lot of different disclosure forms, proprietary things, things like that. We streamlined that. We use Scholar One, so we put a lot of that in the submission process directly. So the author was able to check some boxes, put some things in, it's all captured in the metadata. They don't need to submit that form. You know, It's duplicate, it's not going anywhere. Um, formatting, you know, and, and this gets to the next point about engaging the reviewer pool. The EIC talked to her editorial board. She talked to reviewers. What is important to you to get a paper reviewed? If you see something, you know, if you see a reference that's first name, last name, instead of last name, first name, do you throw your hands up? Are you not able to review the paper? Or is it more important that the science is there, that the science is correct? So they did a really heavy scale back of what authors were asked to do. You know, it's very much a come as you are kind of thing. Um, as long as the authors weren't submitting in wingdings or anything crazy like that, <laughs> the journal was pretty lenient with that kind of stuff. Same thing with figures. Um, you know, the expectation, and authors are always asked to submit high resolution figures. But the journal was sending a lot of things back for that, it just at first submission. So it became, what they did there was just ask the authors, do you have high resolution files? Click yes, we can always get them later, just to kind of save some time. And like I said, you know, the editor did something really good here. I mean, she engaged her reviewer pool. She wanted to know what was it like reviewing for the journal? You know, how did reviewers find it, you know, compared to working with other journals? You know, what can we do to make it better? Are we too stringent? Are we too lenient? Things like that. So she really took that feedback into play. It wasn't a unilateral decision. Um, and what we did was reduce pa paragraphs of requirements on the website, plus an additional PDF with more requirements, down to three or four paragraphs, quick, lean, can be portable to other journals. Um, authors found that really attractive. The other part of this was how do we shorten review times? Um, so the EIC, as many new EICs do, had a really full revamp of her AEs, her associate, uh, her associate editors, her editorial review board. The three requirements she asked were EEO proficient, um, responsive and committed, and those last two probably go hand in hand. That's not to say that you know she wasn't interested in professors emeriti. Yeah, that's the, that's the plural. Or you know, folks who, who were big in the field, but she needed them to be able to work in the system. Um, if you're sending emails back and forth, you can't do it you're slowing things down. And is it more important to have somebody's name on the masthead or a journal that's getting you know, things back to their authors and not to online? 
Um, and one really interesting thing that she did was just decided to cut down how long reviewers had to return papers. The journal had been doing 30 days for five or six years, and that was about the average turnaround time. And she said, what if we just cut it in half? You know, what would happen? And surprisingly, nothing happened. <laughs> they were expecting a lot of pushback. Um, reviewers to kind of flip out and say, this isn't enough time. I have too many other commitments. But the response rates, the return rates, were pretty comparable uh, before and after they made that change. And it was very much, the conclusion there was reviewers will take what you give them. Um, you know, we know that reviewers are by and large a volunteer force. They have a ton of commitments on their time. But if you give them the proper reminders, um, most folks are really diligent. And the worst case is they're going to ask for more time. But if you give them 30 days, they're doing that anyway. Um, so almost immediately when they made that change, the average review time went to 15 days. That's it's two weeks off right there. Um, so kind of the conclusions for that one, I mean, Within six months of taking over, the time of the decision dropped by about five days, which I think was about 10%. Um, and most of that was in you know, not sending things back to authors and in this reviewer thing here. And those turnaround times continued to improve as the journal goes. So I mean, these are just real common sense kind of changes, but had a committed editor who really was thinking, you know, how can I make this better for authors? How can we make this process better? Case study two. Um, Similar-ish journal. So in this case, Wiley owns the journal. It's in food science, about 1,200 annual submissions. Um, as of mid-2015, the journal is taking 80 days from submission to first decision. That's not good in most fields. In this particular field, that's actually like, horrible. Um, and the biggest delays were occurring at the point of review. Invitations would linger for weeks. You know, we use Scholar One. Most journals have an auto reviewer decline. This journal didn't for some reason. The editor seemed kind of resistant at first, thinking that if I turn off this invitation, reviewers are going to get mad, which is kind of crazy. Um, that's how it goes. And then the same thing I think a lot of journals face. This many agreed reviewers were disappearing. Um, they'd agree to do the review. You know, their 14 days would pass. The reminders would run out you would have no review. And again, the editor was a bit hesitant at first to close those out, thinking, well, you know, the time it takes to get another reviewer, you know, what if this other person comes back? They never come back. Just, you know, it just never happens. Um, so what they did was, again, pretty common sense stuff here, but just closing out invitations after two weeks. If you have sent a reviewer a reminder, they haven't responded to multiple things. They haven't said yes, they haven't said no. Close it out and move on. Um, there's really no sense in, in holding these things out forever. And the same thing with, with score sheets. You know, so this journal was giving reviewers two weeks. Um, they were sending reminders before it was due, the due date, a week after. And after two weeks, they were sending a personal note just saying, are you going to be able to do this? We understand if not. If they got no response, they closed it out. Um, and they started engaging their associate editors more and reviewers more to incentivization, things like certificates, um, discounts, um, working through Wiley to kind of incentivize their best reviewers, recognition at the annual conference, things like that. And by doing those things, which don't really seem particularly complicated, they cut their turnaround times in half um, within about a year. So going from 80 days to 40 days, and they're kind of still continuing to improve. So. An author isn't necessarily going to see all this. You know, they're not going to see that this reviewer isn't responding. They're not going to see that this reviewer kind of disappeared into the ether. What they do see is that they're getting their decisions quicker, and they're more li likely to come back because of it. The same journal, um, one of the things that they, they're starting to look at now, and I wish I had kind of more information on this, is more actively engaging authors when there are delays. Um, so the journal's going to be using Scholar One reporting to just flag any manuscripts that are more than a couple weeks behind. And it's working on email templates to authors, not calling out an editor, not calling out a reviewer, you know, not throwing anybody under the bus, but just to keep the author engaged in the process, to let them know your submission is valuable to us. We want to stay engaged with you. You know, we're encountering these delays. We hope to get you a decision as soon as possible. Nothing huge, but just so the author knows that the journal's committed. Um, making sure that the EEO is working for all parties involved. Um, right now, an author, if they log into Scholar One, they'll see that the manuscript is in review. Um, I will not call out any editors or reviewers or journals, but a lot of journals use this to kind of hide bad processes, hide bad editors. You know, even the most committed AE will sometimes miss a paper. Things will sit for a long time. An author gets concerned if they see it. 
But by opening up this black box a little bit and letting the author see where things are in the process, they have a better sense of how the journal works. They're better engaged with it. If they know that the, the paper's out for recommendation with an associate editor, they know that decision's coming. If they know it's in review, they know where it is. Just to curb things off, and if they have questions, they have concerns, yeah, then they can come to the editorial office. But just to make sure, again, that the author is engaged with the journal and opening up the black box just a little bit. You know, we're not talking full open review where the author knows everything, they know reviewer identities, but just demystifying it enough, maintaining integrity so the author, you know, they know you care. Um, and that is actually about it. <laughs> um, so I guess I'll sit for questions, but um, yeah, thanks. <laughs>